When I look at art, even other people's art, I tend to analyze. How did they do that? How did they accomplish that? What did they lay down first? Uh, how did they visualize it? Did they come up with an original idea and then as they painted, they changed it and changed it? Because I do that with some of my stuff. And then other stuff is copy and photographs and it's really planned. If there's something that I don't know how to do, I can go to bookstores. Sometimes I bought a book just because there was one photograph in it that I wanted to use that photograph to add one more duck to my painting. What am I up to nowadays? Um, right now, thinking up new paintings and continuing the two main genres that I like to do, which is imaginary, visiony, visionary, fantasy, science fiction-y stuff, and scenes of the local Bay Area. I uh, have just finished a couple of kind of surrealistic, imaginary paintings. And now I'm going to do a painting of Point Reyes Seashore, which is uh, the, up the north coast from San Francisco. A few years ago, uh, a group of us went out there to spend an afternoon on the beach, and I took a number of photos. And so I want to do an ordinary seascape. Uh, that'll be very next to my next painting. And for me, each new canvas is a whole new world of possibilities. So you don't, the, the next painting doesn't have to have anything to do with the last one. How would, how would you describe your art? Generally, I don't try to describe it. I, I try not to be too much in any one style. And... Uh, it's really hard because the stuff, like the, the palette knife stuff, the, the more abstract stuff that I do, appeals to me a lot. But I really like the realism, uh, and it's probably what I'm best at is that stuff. There's, there's a few things that really shape a person, and I feel like where we live, where we decide to live, yeah. is, is one of those things. Yeah. So that being said... Why Berkeley? Well, when I first came to Berkeley, it was because they had a setup to sell on the street and make money. So I have to admit, I first came here for the money, to sell on the street and make money. Uh, and I think I had an affinity for Berkeley's approach to social issues, the anti-war movement, and the racial discrimination, the way African Americans are treated in America is something that has always bothered me and it's always been a part of the way I think is how minorities are treated, specifically black Americans. Uh, I lived in the South when I was a kid and Berkeley is the kind of place that has a really strong stance in terms of the racial issues and equality for all people, like I know you've seen with the disabled people, but with black people, with Asians, with minorities. So I, I feel like I fit in here. My attitudes about racism and fascism and stuff like that. As I said, the President of the United States was murdered when I was in high school, and that had an effect on me. Uh, and, and when I was in the Navy, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. And those had an effect on me. They form how I view our society. Having been a Vietnam vet, I pretty much am opposed to 
most of the wars that this country has gotten into since Vietnam, particularly like the Iraq War. I think that was a, a, a terrible thing. It was uh, basically to steal those people's oil, and it ended up killing close to a million Iraqi citizens for no good reason. And so in Berkeley, I have people who think the way I do about social issues and about uh, our our country's international relations. You mentioned earlier how you how you grew up in the South, and um, that too probably had a very uh, profound impact on how you see the world and, and shaped who you are. Yeah. Can you speak to that experience of, of growing up where you did and um, specifically any childhood memories that really yeah. uh, shaped well, you in particular? One of the things really is, is because I lived in the South until I was 12, and as I said before, the racial attitudes in the South, it was segregated, you know, and white people lived in white neighborhoods and black people, you never saw black people except on trash day when they came to collect the trash and when i was 12 we moved up north and i spent three years in junior high school in stanford in stanford connecticut in a school that was mixed race where there were black students and puerto ricans and italian and jewish and it was more you know indicative of like the rest of our country and everything and then my family moved to dallas texas so we moved back to an all-white town, and I had to go to an all-white school. And at that point, I felt really alien, you know, uh, not fitting. I really didn't fit in because I, I could never, I could never buy into the 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 belief that so many people have about the superiority of white people. I couldn't, uh, I was never comfortable with that. And so my two and a half years in high school in Dallas, Texas, uh, I really didn't feel like I fit in very much. I ended up leaving school and going into the armed forces, joining the Navy. So that I think is one of the real formative things for me growing up is that three years I spent up north where uh, where I had a different perspective about the way different people of different cultural backgrounds get along and everything. Right, yeah. You know. Yeah. Who inspired you growing up? Who inspired me? Uh, my fifth grade teacher. It's like... Most people my age, you don't remember the names of most of your teachers, but my fifth grade teacher was a, name, a man named Mr. Mercer. And uh, he, was, uh, he was different from most of the other teachers that I had. And the year that I was in fifth grade, the Cuban Revolution was going on. And Mr. Mercer was a supporter of Fidel Castro. I really admired Mr. Mercer for his he actually took time out to teach us about social things. That same year, uh, Adolf Eichmann was captured and brought to Israel to be tried for his crimes during the Nazi years when he was uh, uh, working in a concentration camp. And so that year, Life magazine ran this huge bunch of articles about the Holocaust and about the, the Jewish prisoners during the, the, the regime of the Nazis. And Mr. Mercer, every day after lunch, would pull out Life magazine and read us the articles and show us the photographs. He did this on his own. It was not part of, of the curriculum. And that year, I think one of the students in my class told his parents and they complained and Mr. Mercer got kicked out of the school the following year. But I admired Mr. Mercer, and I, I think he had more of an influence on me than just about any other teacher I had. You know, he was a, a good man. You admired him because he 
stood for what he believed in. Yeah, yeah. You know, he taught us about social issues, about society, and that no other teacher did that. And it got him kicked out of the school, Yeah. you know. Walk me through a day in the life of a 16-year-old Ed. 16-year-old Ed? 16-year-old Ed was going to school in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the Beatles had been out for about a year, year and a half, and Cassius Clay had won the heavyweight championship from Sonny Liston. And I was a big fan of Cassius Clay. I was really happy when he won. And I loved the things he said after he won that fight. Uh, I really loved He was the underdog. Nobody expected him to win. And so I was really pleased that he won. And in that same year, the Beatles came. And in, the, in that time after that, the Rolling Stones, Hermits, Hermits, and a number of other bands came to America. And there were a lot of us in school that were influenced by that and really were taken by, by the Beatles and by the bands that came to the United States from England. So that was one of the main things. Of course, when you're 16, you're thinking about girls all the time. And so dating girls at that time, uh, going to dances and dancing to the, to the music of bands from England was like something I really liked doing. In the spring of 1968, my ship came back from overseas in Vietnam, and we sailed into San Francisco Bay the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. So when we came into the Bay Area, there were a lot of fires all over Oakland and a lot of very angry people. And so I came into San Francisco, and within a month or two, my ship went over to Hunters Point Naval Shipyard, and a lot of guys took leave and liberty. And another sailor and myself got an apartment in downtown San Francisco. And uh, since I wasn't old enough to get in the bars or do a lot of the stuff other guys were doing, I went and got a sketchbook and some pen and ink some pens and uh, pencils, and I would roam the streets of San Francisco looking for things to draw. And one day I went out, walked all the way out to Fisherman's Wharf, and there was a man sitting there behind his camper doing portraits of babies. He had a photograph of a Chinese baby, an African-American baby, and a white baby. And he was doing it as an example to show potential customers his ability to do different kinds of children. And I admired his work for a while, and I went out to the end of the pier, and I did a drawing of those ships that are out at Aquatic Park, the Baklutha and those other ships. I just did a quick pen and ink drawing, took about an hour or so. When I came back, the man had finished his portrait of the three babies, and he and I got to talking, and he invited me to hang out with him for the rest of the day. His name was Leonard Johnson, and he was an African-American man and a very gifted portrait artist. And so I started hanging out with him, and Leonard, I think the first thing we did is we went to the San Mateo County Fair, and we pulled up in the parking lot, and I set up and started to do charcoal portraits on colored textured paper. I would do a copy someone's face in charcoal and I would use white charcoal or chalk to highlight their faces. It was very difficult and you're under a lot of pressure when you do this because the family of the person you're drawing is standing behind you watching how you do it. And uh, so you have to be good. You have to do your best to get a likeness and I could never do the oval and draw the line the way every most people do. I would have to start with one eye, then work my way over to the other eye, and then measure the distance down to the nose and kind of form up the picture that way. So I ended up 
spending that summer when I was on liberty and leave, Leonard and I went and did, as I said, the San Mateo County Fair, the Sacramento State Fair, uh, and the Alameda County Fair in Pleasanton. So that summer, I ended up doing quite a few portraits. And I think one of the things that was really rewarding is that now and then, when you're doing a child and they're looking up at you as you're drawing them, and you would just look in their eye and you would, well, I can't describe it, you would lock in and you would get those eyes just right and get the curve of the face and the nose and you'd capture that expression in their face. And people behind you would be saying things and they would go, oh, look, he's really got it. He's really captured her personality. When people would say that kind of stuff, you would just like, your ego and everything, you would just explode, you know, because you would realize that on this occasion you really did get a really good likeness and somehow in the eyes you captured that expression. And that's a very rewarding experience to hear people praising you that way to where now over the last 50 years, when I'm over in Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, which I would go every few months, I just ride over to the city and walk all over San Francisco and I'd go out to Fisherman's Wharf and I'd come up behind some artist that was doing a portrait and I'd stand in the crowd among them, right? And I'd look down and if he was doing a good job, I would repeat those things that I used to hear 50 years ago and I would say, wow, he's really got it. It looks exactly like her. He's actually captured her expression. This is part of my cyborg costume here, this thing. I made this for Halloween one year. When I first put this outfit together, I had an artificial heart that pumped red Kool-Aid through these clear tubes. I destroyed a black leather jacket in order to do it. Right, And it's rigged for lights, although the batteries and all that don't always work anymore. But this is my cyborg getup. Right? Then in the back, way in the back, is my giant alien lobster suit right there. You can see it right there. It's a motorcycle fairing mounted on a backpack frame with eye stalks and there's all kinds of stuff in there. I have the gorilla suit that you wear underneath the bug suit in here. I've got a pair of elephant feet in a box up there. And this is my very first painting ever right up here. That's my friend Michael Milner. And I did that way back in 1976 or 77. And obviously he just sat while I painted them one afternoon. Doing black and white artwork, you know, you can do it and do it and do it, but if you think you're going to be painting or doing art for the rest of your life, you do want to dive into color. And it's a kind of daunting. You have to buy paint and canvases and start working in color and figuring out how do you color things in and how do you make it look as realistic as you can. A lot of that is just study what color something is, what it looks like under daylight, if it's metal or glass, how does it reflect, what actually are you seeing in a reflection, and then how do you render that to where the person looking at the picture sees the reflection. So Ed, walk me through your brainstorming process. How do you get ideas for your work? Well, there's two ways. Uh, the main way or the, for all the local scenes is I actually drive around looking. Uh, and I generally don't want to do ordinary mundane scenes like a lot of other artists do. I look for images that I know are going to, that I think are going to resonate with people. So I have lots of Golden Gate Bridge pictures, lots of Bay Bridge, uh, a lot of scenes from the Berkeley Hills looking over the bay, the number with the Campanile in it. Uh, so I guess part of my process is I'm trying to find what I think a lot of people will relate to. You know, if I do like an ordinary house on an ordinary street, occasionally I do that, but that painting will sit for years before anybody buys it. Whereas if I do 
a new angle of the Bay Bridge or a new angle, something that nobody else has done, but it still is like a recognizable Bay Area scene, then I'll be the one to do it. I have lots of scenes of Telegraph, lots of scenes from the Berkeley Hills, um, a number of scenes in various parks in Berkeley, um, mainly because I know a lot of local people will recognize that. I have one scene of the Cafe Mediterranean. I have two scenes inside the Cafe Mediterranean because so many people in Berkeley knew the Med, hung out in the Med. Even if they only came to it once or twice, they would recognize it, the way it's laid out and everything. And it's sort of like uh, the one I did, I just recently went all the way back on that, that same pier that I did in 1968 and did a painting of that same view of those same ships that I talked about earlier. So I now have a painting of Aquatic Park from out there on the pier with the same ship, the Balclutha and the other ships there. Again, and I think I kind of missed on that one. I, I very seldom sell a copy of it and I still have the original. But it's, I'm quite sure it's a view that practically everyone in the Bay Area at some time or another has walked out on the pier at Aquatic Park and looked back across the water and seen the pyramid and the Coit Tower and the ships and the beach there and Giardelli Square. So I did it just for that reason. I have a pencil sketch of the Palace of Fine Arts. You know, another painting I did of California Street in San Francisco. So that process is for the local Bay Area stuff. And, the, and the, the visionary, the fantasy, the science fiction stuff, which in many ways is just stuff I get real pleasure out of, that process, it's different. You know, you go trying to imagine or come up with something from a dream. A lot of times it's images from dreams and I do like a plain white canvas. I don't know what's going to go on it. And I'll get like a fundamental idea and lay that out and figure out the light and the dark, like where the light's coming from and how it's going to affect things. And then once I get that, then I want to add something that I wasn't thinking about before. And then I add a couple more things that were not in my initial idea. And I really like those paintings because they're, there's opportunities. There's a chance to go further to... Uh, it's, you, you have more fun with those paintings. You're not restricted to realism. When I first did my painting of Helen of Troy, she had a cloth draped over this shoulder and this shoulder was bare and the breast was showing. So I had a naked woman's breast and behind her was the ruins of the city of Troy. And way down below on the beach, you could see the ships arriving and all. And I noticed that the breast was, there was too much focus on it. The breast, the nipple, this beautiful breast. And one morning before I went to work one day, I just took some, mixed up some paint and I draped a dress, a shoulder over her and covered up that breast and just had the wrinkled cloth around it. And now you see the whole painting. And you don't, people don't just come in. I would see people come in my apartment and they would look right at the breast. And, 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 and now when you look at it, I think it's much more erotic. That's something when I'm doing these imaginary, the fantasy, the science fiction mythology, you experiment. And there'll be times when you don't want to paint something in that distracts from the overall picture. You'll sketch it in and you try it one way, you try it another way, and then finally you just say, don't do it. Don't put it in there. And I like that experimentation with a painting where you start it and you leave a lot of doors open to try this or try this, add this, add this. You go and, and you'll see something, uh, you go watch something or you see something out in the real world and you go, it'll give you an idea on something else you can do to that painting to get a certain effect or something. 
And that is why I like the visionary fantasy, the surrealist stuff, the imaginary things, because there's these doors. You, you, you know, it's like you're exploring as you're doing the painting. What questions um, fascinate you the most? And, and do you think maybe possibly drive your, your artistic preference? I'm kind of on a quest for truth, you know? So I'm always questioning the validity of all kinds of things. I believe that there is an actual truth. People say that truth is relative. People's perspective is relative, but the truth is real. It is immortal, it is eternal, and it doesn't need any justification, it just is. So I am fascinated with that question of truth as opposed to what a lot of people think the way people form their attitudes and stuff like that and mine are formed by I guess constantly admitting I'm wrong to most and you do it in your art whenever you see a mistake that you got to fix when I wrote my book I was having to admit I was wrong 20 times per page for three 400 pages Every time I edited, it's like admitting you're wrong. And after I'd been through 20 edits, I hired an editor and she just cut me to pieces. And again and again and again, admitting you're wrong is how you get to truth or sometimes just a better way of expressing yourself when you're writing or in your art looking at a painting and saying, what's wrong? How do I improve it? You touched on something uh, in that answer about your, your book. And oh, yeah? you talked about that experience. What, what motivated you to take a break from art to focus solely on writing the science fiction book that you did? Well, again, it came from a dream. And I woke up from a dream. And at the beginning of the dream... I was a crew member on a spaceship and I was aware of the thoughts of everyone else on duty. And at the end of the dream, I was a caveman in Stone Age Europe. And when I woke up, I thought, it's the same guy. This guy that was a crew member on a ship ended up becoming a caveman in Stone Age Europe. And so I thought I had a plot to a story. And for probably 10 years, I just, it was in the back of my head and all that. And then one afternoon, I just really got fired up about it. And I sat down and I just started writing. And over the next two weeks of just writing an outline and stuff, the entire plot to the story came to me. Basically, the, most of the, the action and the, the scenes. And, and, and for a number of years, I wrote biographies of the main characters and I wrote out uh, a couple of stories that predate my book just to learn more about the characters. And it wasn't until 1998, probably November, October of 1998, where I just finally sat down and proceeded. I figured out the starting point, which would be right before the accident that causes this spaceship to crash on Earth. And I just started there with these crew members on a spaceship. And they've had an accident and they've got to try to get themselves safely to some solar system where there might be a livable planet. Lo and behold, you know, in my story, they ended up coming to Earth 15,000 years ago. And around 2000, I quit my job and I just went off in my truck, went to Colorado, stayed in motels and traveled around and worked on the novel and just spent the next year and a half hammering my way through the whole novel for the whole about 22 years of story in 31 chapters. And I had to learn uh, a lot of things. I had to one of the most interesting things is you have bad guys, you have evil characters who are 
motivated by a desire for power and control over other people. And I had to become that person, get inside his mind and figure out his value system and how he justifies himself. Another thing I had to do is I had female characters and I had to become a female, think like she does, view the world from her perspective and put a couple of women together and put together a conversation of what two women would have. That was a real challenge for a man. of putting yourself in different characters' shoes is, is a, an excellent way to kind of exercise your, your creativity, your creativity muscles. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious, were there any surprising uh, similarities between writing and painting? Because they're, they're, the mediums are so different. One is language, one is like color. Uh, what was that experience like switching from such a just totally different medium. Well, the hardest thing about writing is you can't find your mistakes unless you go back to page one and read all the way through, sentence by sentence by sentence. Whereas with a picture, you could sit in front of it, scan the whole thing, be real self-critical, and ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? And you'll find what's wrong with it, or you'll get or you'll see something and you don't really like it. So you look around and find some other artist that's done that same thing, rendered cloth the same way. And how did they handle it? And then you apply that to your own. But with writing, one of the things I, I call it, when I first wrote, went through the whole book, it was two and a half years of just writing, is there would be times when you come to a scene and you're, 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 it's a little awkward and you're not sure exactly how to say something. And you know that if you spend the next hour or two trying to figure out this one paragraph or this one group of sentences, that you're going to lose your momentum. So you, you would do what I called, you blunder on through. And I would, that was when I first wrote, I blundered through. And so a year or two later, when I'm editing... I would be reading along and I would come to that scene. I'm just like, ah, what are you saying? What, what, what is wrong with you? You know, and you'd have to step out. And it's almost like you go back to where you were a year ago or two years ago when you were first writing this sequence and, and think to yourself, what is it you're trying to say? And how do you, what words? I destroyed a thesaurus writing that book. I did. When I started writing it, I thought I had a great vocabulary. But in the end, I went and bought a thesaurus and I shredded it in the years that I was editing. I mean, it, the, the outside, it was a paperback and the, most of the cover was destroyed and held together with scotch tape. There was a dark gray band along the side from the hundreds of times that I'd thumbed through it could return to your 25 year old self knowing all that you know now what advice would you give them for becoming a better artist faster faster yeah well there's probably nothing I could do in that regard um, the best thing faster would have been to take lessons and in fact, I did. I had a friend that worked for the Veterans Administration who convinced me to go out to Laney College and sign up for a bunch of art classes or to sign up for anything, mainly to get the check. But when I went out there, I took a figure drawing class and a painting class and a commercial art class. And then I was another one on radical psychology that I took too. But what I did do is take those classes. I wasn't, at the time, I, I was just interested in getting the money, but I would say that the figure drawing class and the painting class helped me get going a lot faster. The figure drawing class, I was already doing lots and lots and lots of figures, but the figure drawing class really helped me 
concentrate more on hands and feet and uh, was just making me a lot easier with the human figure, which I was pretty good with it anyway. But I don't think there's anything I could have done that at the age of 25 would have improved it, would have improved me any faster than the rate I've gone as it is. I would say the best thing for me was the 10 years I spent in the 4th Street studio. That was around 2001 until 2011. It was about 10 years. I was in that studio with about 30 or 40 other artists. And as long as I was paying the membership fee to be there, it gave me incentive to get a lot of work done. And the majority of the stuff that I sell today was painted there. And a lot of it was just being there, having a studio and a place to work. But the influence of the other artists and my belief that if I'm going to spend this money, I'd be in this studio, I'm going to be in it a lot. And I probably didn't have any social life beyond that studio for the most part. You know, I'd go hang out in the local restaurant and drink a few glasses of wine. I'd occasionally come up here. But for about 10 years, I spent a good bulk of my life in that studio. And I got, I learned a lot and I got a lot of work done. You know, uh, I guess part of being around 30 or 40 other artists, you get a real sense of who you are among other artists. You know, were you interacting with the other artists much? Very much. In a lot of ways, you know. Um, I think I grew to really appreciate the abstract a lot better being there. And I have to admit, a lot of my appreciation was seeing how it sold. You know, I, I'd admit it. Uh, and, and getting to recognize what's really good uh, balance in an abstract painting. You know, by my own standards, it's just like wine because each of us has our own taste of what we like in wine and I think the same thing applies especially in abstract work what it is you really appreciate you know and I appreciate as I said before stuff that I don't do that is like beyond me even I like that work the best often you know do do any exercises that you did while you were at Laney College taking the art classes that you did stand out to you as uh, especially important for developing your, your artistic abilities? Probably the figure drawing. Uh, learning to sort of draw a figure and then drape the cloth over it later. You know, but uh, I don't know, really. I, uh, you know, I only was with that group. I joined a mural group there. And being in a mural group with like five or six other artists, uh, it enables you to get a large amount of painting done. When you're painting on walls, you get a lot of artwork done and you get a lot of artwork sort of under your belt so you feel a lot more confident when you're going to start your collection of your own paintings you know so i'd say that the mural class because that was the other thing i did is i joined a mural group there and that it was good it was good it, it makes you more confident in your work after you've done a whole bunch of square footage of, of work on a wall. What's something every artist should try at least once? Well, that's hard to say, really. I think every artist has their own path. Um, and I would, I don't know, because there's so many different ways that people do art some people they're set in the way they're going to do it from the beginning and it's best for them to just stay with 
the thing that they do that they're comfortable with, you know. Uh, for myself, and I wouldn't recommend what every artist should do, but for myself, I like to stimulate change. I move. I never stay in one apartment longer than about five years and I move, which is made life more and more and more difficult for me because every time I, I move, the rent goes up. I move to a more expensive place. I don't have the money, but it stimulates change. And as you can see with my work, I'm always wanting to change. Find something more interesting to do or something like that. I wish that I could paint like some of the abstract people I know. You know, this would be the real me right there, right? That would be something that, you know, I go searching up in the Berkeley Hills or the Oakland Hills looking for sunsets, you know. And this is sort of a, a typical sunset of mine. You know, kind of a typical what a good deal or the, the basic kind of paintings that I do is this stuff here. View of the bay with sunsets. So, shall we? It would probably be Salvador Dali and I wish I could speak Spanish better before I had lunch with him because he's his English is terrible um, you know between Salvador Dali and Michelangelo in my life Salvador Dali has been just the greatest artist of all but uh, when I was younger it was Michelangelo, and you know, as you know, he was more a stone sculptor than he was a painter. He did do the Sistine Chapel and a few paintings, but he was a sculptor. And when I was younger, I always thought that the Pieta, the statue of the of Christ in his mother's lap, uh, when I was younger, I thought that was the greatest work of art on earth. But really, Salvador Dali would be the person I'd most want to have lunch with and I would ask him how do you do this and how do you do that and how did you do this and all of that I mean that would be it like how did you get this effect or how did you get the idea to do this you know the metamorphosis of Narcissus uh, there was a number of paintings uh, the tuna fishing which I think is in my opinion is one of the best paintings ever done by him um, uh, by anyone but I think his tuna fishing is a, is a masterpiece of surrealist art what's an uncommon experience you've had which was so positive for you that it makes you feel sad to know that most people will never experience it well uh a uncommon experience. I think the first time when we had a theater here called the UC Theater, and they used to show two different movies every night. And they had a film called Children of Paradise, which was filmed in Paris in 1945 while the Germans were occupying France. And the film was made without the Germans knowing that the film was being made. And it's a truly beautiful story 
about a woman and of four different men who are involved with this woman in different ways. And it's just, and, and one of the men is an actor and another one is a mime and one of them is a criminal and another is a count. And I can recall maybe an hour into that film as I was watching it for the first time in the UC theater and feeling sad that I would never get to see it again for the first time. And it's in French with English subtitles, so you had to continually take your eyes off the screen to read the dialogue. But that feeling of sadness that I could never see this again for the first time. Now, I, that movie is considered a, a masterpiece of filmmaking and art, and I understand why. And I'll never get to see it again for the first time, you know? Mm. Now, that's probably different from what a lot of other people think or feel, but I can remember in the film, sitting in the theater, feeling and thinking that, you know? What is an uncommon tool you use every day for making art that at this point would be hard to live without? An uncommon tool? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that comes to mind? No. No, I think I use all the tools that everybody uses. Probably the tool that often is very useful to me is this huge collection of art books. I have one whole row of books by artist, starting with the A's going through to the Z's just about, you know. And then below that, I have a whole big shelf of books on how to do things and also books of art collections of various museums and stuff like that. But I have a lot of them are just how to do this, how to do that. I call them how-to books uh, and books on like I have a book on abstract art you know another book on commercial art and those that's a tool like that whole big bookshelf is a tool that is very useful to me so that's maybe not an uncommon tool but it's certainly a tool I use having probably a hundred hundred books a hundred art books to consult art and photography but mostly art what is your relationship with your dreams? For the most part, not much. I just recently am transcribing a lot of dreams in a book. And... Sorry, your own personal dreams? or They're my own personal dreams. Like a dream journal? Uh, it's a dream journal. Okay. Uh, if I'm in a dream and I come up behind some artist that's working on a really great painting... I have a right to wake up and steal this idea and do it myself. I like that. Or there's a number of dreams I have that are look like would be really interesting plots to a story, like a short story that I could write based on just what I saw in that dream, you know, the experiences of that dream. And I was just looking through the journal because I haven't been writing in it. And I just added a whole bunch of dreams yesterday but I looked through the previous ones. I have a whole plot to a story and I'd forgotten that it came from a dream. And I had to go back and there it was. And I thought, oh, the name of the band, all kinds of stuff like that. that and usually if I was going to write a story from a dream, I would try to stay true to the dream. And every major aspect of the dream would be in the story. You know, I wouldn't deter. I... I it's like having respect for the inspiration. Is there someone in the art world, um, say like in the last 10 or 20 years, that you're aware of that you feel is underrated? No. No, I don't think so. Usually if I even know about them, their publicity is pretty far out there. Um, there's one artist in our studio, uh, a man, his name was Mark Popple. He's from England. 
who I think is one of the best artists I've ever met or known, um, is really good. He, he teaches his students by copying the masters. So he would actually bring up a picture by Constable or Turner, because he prefers English artists, but he, there isn't anybody that he couldn't copy. You know, he could copy Rubens. I've seen him copy Rubens, Turner, and you could not tell the difference between the, the Rubens and the Mark Popple. And, uh, and he also does a bit of abstract work and I would say if there's anybody underrated, it's him. You get to select one piece of art for every human being on Earth to be stuck with alone in a room for an hour. Just them and that art piece. Yeah. Which piece do you choose and why? Well, I would choose Tuna Fishing by Salvador Dali. I would spend a lot of time just admiring that, studying it, in, inspecting it, you know, I would. For myself, that would be just about my favorite painting, Tuna Fishing by Salvador Dali. It's a big painting, big as a wall. And it's just, uh, it incorporates um, a wide range of techniques. And it was probably done in 1967 during the peak of the psychedelic era. And uh, it has optical illusions. It's got incredible photographic realism. All of that in one painting. And uh, for myself, if I was going to be alone with a painting for an hour, that would be it. So this would be the far right panel right here. Okay. Probably the second one from there to oh, the occupation. Here it is. This one. This is probably the busiest one of all. See? So that each panel kind of fits. Okay. Yeah. Back from the left over there. You can look at the left. You see UC Berkeley. This is Patrick Connolly down there. He was a disabled artist. He's doing a portrait of Ed Roberts going out to Mill Valley, uh, Sausalito in that area. Ed Roberts became the first severely disabled student to enroll in and then graduate from the University of California at Berkeley. The program he pioneered was so successful, the school made it permanent. And it became a model for other disabled student programs around the country. There are very few people, even with the most severe disabilities who can't take control of their own life. The problem is that people around us don't expect us to. Then it spreads into, this is still supposed to be UC Berkeley, and you have art by disabled people up on the walls here. The ones that I could copy, ones that I actually could copy, because some of them are even too good for me to be even able to copy them. Then from that panel, we go into a scene where in 1977, a bunch of people with disabilities took over the federal offices in San Francisco and in other cities and occupied it for about 24 days until Jimmy Carter and the, the politicians at the time finally signed the 504 Equal Rights Aspect of the American Disabilities Act. And I went out of my way to get real people who were doing real stuff at the time. And then this is when they confront the politicians over here, right? These are various people that were involved with CIL at the time. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of sex but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across the country is going to continue. It is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally maybe you begin to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to up oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. And then I go across to uh, various politicians. 
This is the provision 504 right here. I have it on a table on top of the Declaration of Independence, various other paperwork involving that. Then over here, I'm showing as it evolves out into a street march. These are all real people that were part of the protest. And then here I have city workers with a Department of Public Works truck taking out the curbs to form ramps. And this is happening in New York City. So I've moved across from the University of California over to New York City. And also when you back away and look at the whole picture, you see disabled people in interiors breaking out into exteriors on either side. So they're coming out into the world with the rest of us. It's a project that was done out of love because it was a real inspiration, you know, to see disabled people taking power and taking responsibility for their own freedom and for their equal rights. To finally cap it off, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, say kind of as a final thing that you wish you could have said? Well, I would say for myself, and, and it's what I would say anybody else, you draw and you paint what you are interested in, you know, and I think everybody should do that. You know, it's like, the kind of art that you find most interesting and the mo one that you're most comfortable with, that's the stuff you should do at the moment that you're doing it. And you'll find if you em em embarked in a career of art that it'll change over the years. But every time you're doing something, you should be doing the thing that is most interesting to you. All right. Well, okay. Monroe. Okay. Thank you for taking the time film about you uh -huh. and have this conversation. All right. Well, I hope you edit out all the foolishness, <laughs> you know, and the blunders, mistakes and errors. We definitely got a lot, so. Yeah.